time, hell yes, we're gonna take your AR-15, your AK-47. <laughs> Are you sure about that? It's a good place. We are in the middle of it, right up on the mountain. If this son of a bitch wants to bitch about his cows over here and shoot at me, well, it's our country. All right, good evening, everybody. This was the first part of a series I'm going to call the Minuteman series. This first part is covering something that is rather over forgotten personal identification. Uh, most people think dog tags. When you think, you know, personal identification or name tapes, but it's really a little bit more encompassing than that. Uh, one thing this video is not going to be covering is signaling. Uh, I want to make the clear distinction that's not going to be covered here. Alright, so I suppose the first place we should start is, why do you need personal information? Well, at the very genesis, when we're talking about shooting at people, there's the chance that you can be shot back at. It's actually a very high likelihood, which means there's a chance you could die. A lot of this information is going to boil down to getting you to the right places if you're injured or unfortunately die. Dog tags are a great way to accomplish this. Um, the minimum information a dog tag should have is your first name, your last name, and uh, blood type and religion. That's the minimum. Uh, the military has changed this standard, but just for simplicity, just stick with that. Other things you consider if you have any uh, major allergies, especially to medication, um, an allergy dog tag, uh, what you're allergic to. Um, now I suppose we could talk about dog tag placement. So, you know, the typical one would just be around your neck. That's fine. You should definitely do that. Um, other than that, it is not a bad idea to have a dog tag in your back pocket. It is not a bad idea to have a dog tag in a boot. The reason you would do this and separate your dog tags is that in the event that you were unfortunately dismembered, we would still have something to identify you. Or if there was a dog tag loss, you still got three more on your person. Alright, moving on from dog tags, um, the other one that everybody would think of would be name. It's fairly self-explanatory, but a name tape is just that, your name. Uh, generally your last name, and then you could also have a unit or organization name tape also, who you belong to. This is not a bad idea either. Um, name tapes, you know, generally they would have them on the top. Also, it's not uncommon to see them sewn on the back of a pants pocket. Same reason we discussed in the dog tag. Now, you don't necessarily need to go out and drop a lot of money and get name tags for every single uniform you have and every pair of pants you have and get these sewn on or whatever. No, you don't. Now, that is definitely probably the best option. Simply writing under the collar of your shirt and under the inline of your belt line for your pants with a permanent marker, your name, and some type of identification code. This would be a battle roster number. A battle roster number is generally the first initial of your first and last name and the last four of your social security number. For example, John Doe has a social security number 1234567899. Then his battle roster would be JD6789. First, last initial, last four, social security number. Also, when talking about name tapes, inevitably the question of rank is going to come into play. While you don't need rank, you do need a rank structure. People need to be able to identify the leadership because in chaos, that's who they're going to be looking for for guidance. The easiest way to do this is with some type of identification of who is in charge. It doesn't have to be your typical sergeant, lieutenant rank structure. This could simply be call signs, but everybody must know for certain who is in charge. We will get into call signs later. All right, moving forward, the next big piece is going to be how to identify your gear. Now, this is where we're going to deviate a little bit because this can cover a few important areas. The biggest one being is you don't want people to steal your stuff. Uh, that might seem a little odd 
thinking people would just steal your stuff when you're fighting with each other, but I guarantee you it happens. So, you can always just sew a name tape on. Or, like I said, you could write on the inside of a ruck, etc. My personal belief, the best way to identify your gear is either to sew a name tape on, or with some type of a luminescent tape, put it on the frame of such things like a backpack. Now, you're not going to want to put a luminescent tape on a flick or something, but this is a great way to identify uh, stuff with hard pieces, if that makes sense. So, like a rucksack, for example. Here you see a, a good demonstration of that with a Molly 2 rucksack. See, he's got his name and what unit he belongs to. What unit he belongs to is a uh, big thing. Now, why would you need this? Well, besides people stealing your stuff, another good reason is you drop your ruck at the ORP. This mission doesn't go as planned, and everybody scatters. Somebody comes along, returns to the ORP. The enemy didn't know where the ORP is because you selected a good one. You know, you were one terrain feature away or two to 400 meters. Uh, they find your stuff. They need a way to give it back to you. Now, this would require militias to have some type of cross-communication which right now is pretty much non-existent. But in the perfect world where militias had cross-communication and they could identify, let's say, if somebody belonged to the Ohio 2nd Battalion Rifles, they could inevitably get that gear back to them. Or if it's something as simple as, let's say, 1st Platoon went out, 2nd uh, Platoon was in depth, 1st Platoon had to scatter, 2nd Platoon could go to that RP, get the gear, and they knew how to get it back to them. And everybody knew whose ruck belonged to who. Now, things like helmets, patrol caps, and beanies uh, can generally follow the same rules. You know, you're looking for your name, uh, helmet, you want a little bit more info, blood type, etc. Helmets are another good one. You can put a piece of a loom tape inside of the helmet and write all that personal identification, battle roster, unit information on there. Uh, helmets also have the option of sewing on stuff like helmet patches. Or if you know you have one of the cool Gucci helmets, you can just Velcro it on there. Uh, you don't want to be putting a bunch of morale patches on. We'll get into that at a later date. Uh, other gear you consider putting your name on is your stuff, uh, your webbing, you know, like a flick or something. Having your name sewn on the back of your flick or plate carrier or whatever is never a bad idea. When leadership is going around trying to find people and gather their bodies up for the next phase or whatever, uh, it's pretty simple to look at somebody back of their neck and see their name sewed on the flick or on the handle of their plate carrier. A permanent marker will also do perfectly fine here. If you write your name on the inside of the webbing, yes, it's not going to be easy to identify you, but at least you'll be able to know what gear is yours, etc. Another great way of identification is call sign patches. While this can take place of a rank, and it could potentially take place of a name tape, although I wouldn't recommend that because uh, expecting everybody to pay attention or remember everybody's call sign is pretty unlikely. Um, call sign patches can be very helpful, again, for identifying leaders, but there must be discipline with this. You can't just have everybody running around with their call sign being Heathen Eagle 49. It's too long. They need to be short, simple, and to the point. They also need to be standardized. Um, 07 could be, you know, typically it's a platoon sergeant. 06 is the officer in charge. There needs to be some type of standardization. You just don't want everybody running out with some random name and number combination. Uh, going along with patches, um, not morale patches, because we don't want morale patches, right? Uh, one, you're going to get made fun of. Everybody's going to call you a pogue. That's what pogues do. But unit patches, i.e. the American flag that are on troops, that's a great way to identify. So for the militia, this could be as something as whatever your militia group is, get patches made. They need to be modest. You don't want anything crazy. They don't need to be big. It needs to be very simple. Could just be your state's flag. Um, again, this is where coming in, linking with other militias and being able to identify other militias, patches. This is important. But yeah, generally stay away from morale patches. You don't want people running around with gear that's covered in, you know, a bunch of Punisher logos. It's corny and it's ugly and you look like a nerd. All right, moving on, uh, everything else could also fall in this category, but moving on into tactical personal identification. Um, the biggest piece here would be camo standardization. While there is inevitably going to be mixed max camo, I mean, if you look at the United States Army, it's had mixed max camo for the last 10 years while they've tried to figure out if they want multi-camera UCP. But in general, you want some type of uniform standardization. If we've got six guys with six different camo patterns and three of them are wearing multi-camo, 
and the enemy's wearing multi-camo, it can become an issue. Camo standardization is important. Now, not everybody needs to be perfect, but there need to be some type of standardization. And when we're talking about civil defense, we need to realize that a lot of the fighters are going to have never participated in any type of training like this or any militia leading up to this. So they're generally not going to have any camo besides maybe some hunting camo, but a lot of them are just going to be in regular people's clothes. So a way we can combat this problem, we need to look no further than the Ukrainian conflict. Armbands. Armbands are a great option. Um, if everybody has on a yellow armband, then we know, okay, everybody with a yellow armband belongs to such and such. Nobody on the enemy side should be wearing an armband. Now, there are issues with this possibly giving away positions due to the fact that it is a bright color. But in the end, this could be defeated by possibly painting the front side of it. Inevitably, you would want your front side to the enemy. This is not always possible, but it is a way to potentially combat this. Now, moving on from this, we'll be covering personal identification during nighttime. Um, this is a big issue. We don't want everybody running around with white lights on, uh, looking like some type of weird raves going on. A big way to combat this, if not everybody has night vision, which is going to be the case, is what the U.S. military would call cat eyes. This is luminescent tape on the back of gear, uh, whether it be a PC, a rock, a flick, etc. Um, you can be using this for unit identification also. Let's say if 2nd Platoon, they had two stripes, 1st Platoon, one stripe. Um, leadership had a diamond or something like that. That's a way you could also throw in leadership into this also. Now for the people with night vision, um, we have a couple more options. Uh, one of the cheapest ones would be a IR strobe using a 9 volt battery. And this is something that everybody could have so that the people with night vision could still be able to identify them. Also a great way to uh, signal for any type of uh, overhead reconnaissance assets, i.e. a drone. These drones don't even need to have night vision capability because most cameras still have the ability to detect IR light. So if everybody could have one of these beacons and for $9, I think that's uh, $9 and the price of a 9 volt battery, I think that's very achievable. And with the price of a $400 drone, you could, you could keep track of pretty much an inevitable amount of people for $9 a piece. Now, moving forward, we have some other options. There's a plethora of IR strobes out there. Probably one of the most affordable ones and the uh, battle-tested ones would be the MS-2000 strobes. Uh, most commonly, these are attached to a chit sheet, which would be for getting captured, and these would be in the helmet band most commonly. Uh, again, this allows for overhead uh, recognition. Now, we need to talk about leadership's responsibility. Leadership needs to have some type of control a list of everybody's personal identification, next to kin addresses, and uh, sensitive item serial numbers. Now these need to be a little bit inconspicuous, and this can be difficult, but when we are talking about the use of the militia, it is very possible that the enemy we're facing could go to a next of kin's address or look up somebody's social security number. So this is where it gets into, you kind of, we kind of need to play a different game here. Now the ways this could be accomplished is, let's say, for a next of kin address. Well, don't actually use a next of kin. Use somebody else's address <clears throat> um, that could still, who knows this person and could identify the actual next of kin. That's the way this could be accomplished. Now for battle roster numbers, we need to get away from using actual social security numbers because again, in a fight on American soil, it's very easy to look up somebody's social security number, especially by uh, the government. So a way this could be complicated by be a simple number cipher. Uh, in a letter cipher, J isn't actually J. J is Z. 9 isn't actually 9. 9 is 2, if you get what I'm saying. Now this would have to be standardized, and at a minimum it should be standardized against your unit. In a perfect world, I suppose this would be standardized across uh, militias in the outbreak of an event, but that's next impossible. But at least at your echelons and your leadership's echelon, this needs to be a thing. Now, why weapons? Why do we need weapons here? Well, in general, we need to keep track of sensitive items. Uh, everybody needs to have their stuff tied down, but that's a talk for another day. Um, in the event that somebody does go down, they get injured, or God forbid, we lose somebody. We need to have an idea of what was lost and what we have on hand. If their squad leader has a bump card and they see, okay, his nods were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 serial number. He had a PVS-14. Uh, he had an M4 and an M9. Well, all he has is an M9. Somebody comes across him. Uh, they got the bump card from the squad leader. All there is is an M9. Okay, 
we know there is a pair of night vision missing and there is an M4 missing. All right, that wraps up part one of the Minuteman series, personal identification. Remember, it is a simple task, but it is the task that if you don't do it when you need it the most, you will immediately realize how important it was for you to do. It needs to be standardized, but it is simple to accomplish. Standard and inconspicuous. That is the code words for this. All right, guys, remember, when it comes to shoot, move, and communicate, the two latter are vastly more important than the first one. Take care.